I looked up in wonder at God's wonderful ways and thought how little we imagine what may be the result of listening and acting on a desire he puts into the heart. If he puts it into the heart, he will bless it if we try to act upon it, and great will be the effect before God. This is Catherine Drexel. She was born three years before our nation's struggle over slavery precipitated the start of a civil war and just a few years before one of the bloodiest battles ever between whites and Native American Indians. This is Catherine's story. Philadelphia. The city was filled with new Americans who arrived here looking for promised freedoms and new opportunities. Among the early newcomers was Catherine's grandfather, Francis Martin Drexel, who had left his native Austria in 1817. Four years after his arrival, Francis married Catherine Hookie, and they began a family. As Philadelphia grew into a financial and industrial power, Francis decided money was to be made in banking. Two of Francis Drexel's sons, Anthony Joseph, better known as founder of Drexel University, and Francis Anthony, Catherine's father, became partners in the newly owned banking firm Drexel & Company. Francis Anthony, the oldest of the Drexel boys, married Hannah Langstroth. Their marriage was happy but brief. They had two little girls, Elizabeth and Catherine, but they never got to know their mother. Five weeks after Catherine's birth, in 1858, Hannah died. Two years later, Francis met and married a deeply religious woman named Emma Bouvier. She was a distant aunt of former First Lady Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy Onassis. Three years after the marriage, Emma gave birth to her own child, a little girl they named Louise. Elizabeth, Catherine, and Louise were inseparable growing up. They traveled the world together and enjoyed a lifestyle only the privileged could afford. From a young age, Catherine and her sisters learned by word and example from their parents about the Catholic faith. They watched as three days a week Emma opened their door to the poor. Catherine also developed a special devotion to the Eucharist, understanding it as a personal union with the heart of Jesus and all his saints. Catherine wrote many letters and kept journals in which she documents her experiences. My father had business out west, and he took us with him. The west was a new country then, and we visited many of the Indian settlements, occasionally glimpsing a priest who was in charge of a chapel or a school. We went all the way out to Tacoma, Washington. It was a long, wild trip in those days. At Tacoma, we met a priest I had known in Rome. He was working among the Indians and had established a church and school for them. I was so impressed by his work that I wanted to do something for it, too. So I took $100 out of my clothes allowance and bought a statue of the Blessed Virgin for his church. I was almost afraid to tell my father, but when I did, he put both of his hands on my shoulders and said, I'm glad you did, Katie. It was a good thing. When Catherine was 21, her stepmother, Emma, was diagnosed with cancer. Catherine nursed her through three years of intense suffering until her death in 1883. During this time, Catherine began thinking Christ might be calling her to the religious life. Two years later, her father, Francis, suddenly died. In his will, he left to his daughters the interest income from 90% of his estate, valued in 1885 at $15 million and estimated today at more than $300 million. With her inheritance, Catherine began building schools on the Indian reservations, as well as providing food, clothing, and financial support. I didn't think of becoming a religious until years after I had become interested in missionary work on the Indian reservations. It was long after I had begun to help build schools for Indians and Negroes and endeavored to get priests and nuns to do the work of religious training in those schools. It suddenly seemed to me one night that something inside of me was saying, You keep sending others to do this great work for you. Why don't you do it yourself? Upon approval of her spiritual director, Bishop O'Connor of Omaha, Nebraska, she entered religious life and began her formation with the Sisters of Mercy. 
In 1891, in addition to the three vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, she took a fourth vow, to be the mother and servant of the Indian and Negro races. As foundress of the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament, her vast financial wealth was now transformed into a poverty of spirit that became a daily constant in a life supported by bare necessities. In 1894, the first band of pioneering Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament journeyed to Santa Fe, New Mexico, to teach at St. Catherine's Indian School. Five years later, she opened St. Francis de Sales School in Virginia for African-American girls. From the inner cities of the East, from Florida to Texas and California, the sisters opened almost 60 missions and schools, health centers, houses of prayer, and pastoral centers. They were not always eagerly welcomed by the neighbors. Mother Catherine and her sisters would need to stand their ground against vandals, arsonists, and the Ku Klux Klan. Mother Catherine's crowning achievement was the establishment in 1925 of Xavier University of Louisiana, the only historically black Catholic college in the United States. Always a woman of intense prayer, Mother Catherine found most profoundly in the Holy Eucharist the source of her love for all people, especially the poor, forgotten, and oppressed. Knowing that many Americans were far from free, living in substandard living conditions, denied education and constitutional rights enjoyed by others, she felt a compassionate urgency to help change racial attitudes in the country. A severe heart attack in 1935 curtailed Mother Catherine's missionary travels. For almost 20 years, as her health waned, she gradually became confined to her room overlooking the Mother House Chapel in Ben Salem, Pennsylvania. She continued to offer herself to God through a life of prayer, especially in adoration before the Blessed Sacrament. In Holy Communion, the life of God in a particular way is imparted to my soul. It is there that God becomes the soul of my soul, to do to suffer all for love of him who died for me. And if you are for me, if you are with me, what can I fear, O oh my God? Mother Catherine Drexel died in her 97th year on March 3, 1955. At the time of her death, the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament had grown to some 500 members in 51 convents. Following her death, Two miracles were confirmed and attributed to intercessory prayer to Mother Catherine. At the age of 14, Bob Gutherman, rendered deaf in one ear, had his hearing restored. In 1994, little Amy Wall, who was born deaf, was also cured. On October 1, 2000, Pope John Paul canonized Mother Catherine in St. Peter's Square. She is the second American-born canonized saint. Her feast day is celebrated on March 3rd. St. Catherine believed each person was called by God to be a saint and that her efforts were nothing other than what God expected. Renouncing wealth is a compelling story, but St. Catherine Drexel did far more. She gave her life. I am not made to enjoy riches, luxury. These are not my end. My end is God. All is his gift. All must be returned to him. <laughs>